and Mike Mooker. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, conference. Another Yorkshireman using technology. Bloody hell. <laughs> Britain has a proud military history, and despite years of cuts and underinvestment and political betrayals, we still have, in my opinion, the best armed forces in the world. And it's a good job, really, as it seems like every other day, another threat to the UK develops. We are well aware of the risk associated with the resurgent and militaristic Russia and how the so-called Islamic Caliphate in the Middle East threatens global peace. But there is, in my opinion, an even more insidious threat to our national security. This is a threat that is rarely discussed by the news media or by British politicians. This threat is the development of a combined EU army. The fact is, the ability to wage war if necessary is a principal tenant of state sovereignty. However, the EU's unelected leadership in Brussels realised that without a combined army, under the control of the EU Commission, they will never have the muscle to achieve their goal of creating a super state called Europe. <laughs> this is why I believe the EU is working towards seizing control of all the EU's individual armed forces by, at the latest, 2025. Jean-Claude Juncker's call last year for a combined army was no mistake. This is especially true when you consider the Germ Germany's defence minister, Ursula von der Leyen, made a similar call at roughly the same time. For me, Juncker and von der Leyen's comments mark the start of a programme to make normative a previously secret agenda for the creation of a combined EU army. However, other EU officials have been less cautious in admitting how developed the EU's plans are. The EU's true intentions were revealed by EPP President Joseph Dow last October when he said that an EU army would take over border controls and replace national forces and that it was developing much faster than people believed. At the same time, he also admitted that the European Parliament will try to push through plans that go far beyond what even Mr Juncker had intended. And in January 2016, European Parliamentary Group Leader Guy Verhofstadt put a time frame on the proposal saying, last year our political group proposed the establishment of a European Defence uni Union with a roadmap towards integrated military forces, a European army by 2025. And according to a report hidden on the ISS website, which you can read uh, about in the Sunday Express tomorrow, the EU plans to have a military structure in place by 2021. In fact, plans are so developed, the EU have already allocated 2.5 billion euros for a common research and development project, so Brussels can start developing and building its own weapons. And despite David Cameron's protestations that he will never agree to an EU army, make no mistake, the UK's armed forces are within the, the EU sites. And judging by Cameron's weakness in the recent renegotiations, he has neither the power nor the prestige within the EU to fight these plans. But surely the UK government and the legacy parties would never betray the British people and sell our democracy down the river. <laughs> well, thank you again. Less than two years ago, arch-europhile Nick Clegg 
described the creation of a European army as a dangerous fantasy, and simply not true. The problem for Clegg is that his dangerous fantasy is fast becoming a dangerous reality. In 2007, seven years before Clegg's statement, Labour's Gordon Brown and David Miliband signed the Lisbon Treaty. Buried within the realms of the legislation is Article 42, which calls for a common security and defence policy that shall provide the European Union with an operational capacity by drawing on the civilian and military assets of member states. Or in other words, the creation of an EU army. And when you look at what components of an EU army are already in place, the picture becomes clear. Take the European External Action Service, the EU's own military committee. This body encompasses a range of functions, including the EU's own military staff, the EU's military operations centre, an EU satellite intelligence arm, the European Defence Agency, the European Security and Defence College, and a body to oversee the European defence industry. And who would have thought that we would see a British general serving under the EU flag and with an EU insignia on their uniform? But by the time Clegg was dismissing the EU army as a dangerous fantasy, this had already happened following Lieutenant General David Leakey's term as Director General of the EU military staff in Brussels. This military body is in fact so advanced it has even started signing cooperation agreements with the United States outside of the NATO structure. Then we have the EU NAVFO, the EU's anti-piracy and people trafficking operation that is supplementary to NATO's own operation, and which is today commanded by a British Royal Marine Major General Martin Smith, MBE. As well as EU NAVFO, there is also the European Maritime Force, a range of naval craft that can be deployed by contributing nations within five days of the order being given. Then there are the EU's land forces. Most prominent are the 18 battalion-sized EU battle groups that the UK contributes troops and equipment towards. These EU battle groups are like the naval arm, supplemented by a secondary force known as EU force. This is a rapid reaction force operated as part of the common security and defence policy, which aims to complement other EU military forces such as Eurocorps, the European Gendarmerie Force, European Maritime Force, EU battle groups, just to name a few. The EU has even established its own he military heavy, uh, heavy airlift capability in the form of the EU Air Transport Command. And as of January 2016, the combined fleet under the authority of the EATC represents 60% of Europe's military air transport and refuelling ca capacity. Recently, we even saw the Italian Air Force sign over all its air transport aircraft to EATC command. But most worrying is the recent rebranding and expansion of the EU border force, formerly known as Frontex, to become the European Borders and Coast Guard Force. This new force will not only be able to buy and lease its own equipment, access data from a, a range of agencies across the EU, and carry weapons of varying types, it will be able to deploy on a member state's territory without that country's explicit consent. Historically, any paramilitary force, no matter the name, that has been deployed on another country's territory without that state's express permission has been known as an army of occupation. And despite there being no official announcement of an EU army, Germany and the Netherlands are already pushing 
ahead to combine their militaries with Germany taking command of crack Dutch paratroopers. Do you still think an EU army is fantasy, Nick? Because I don't. When you're considering all these facts and analyse the many hundreds of other clothes which point to the EU's true intentions, it suggests to me only one thing. And the simple fact is, like it or not, if we stay in the European Union, we will not only see the continuation of a political integration, but also full military integration, putting an end to the British Armed Forces as a sovereign entity. When you also consider that, according to newspaper reports, David Cameron has been told by German Chancellor Angela Merkel to drop his opposition to the creation of a combined EU force in return for delivering his pathetic renegotiation, that day, I think, will be sooner rather than later. The fact is, by ceding control of our own military to the EU, we would be removing one of the last major principles of our liberal democracy. Yeah. And instead, we would become nothing more than a region of a nuclear-armed and expansionist EU dictatorship. The only true way to secure the UK's future and make sure that we can face all threats to our interests, both today and tomorrow, is to vote Brexit. Thank you very much. <laughs>